So, Andy, uh, YouTube is up, but Facebook is not. YouTube's up. Did you say Facebook is up? Oh, okay. Well, that's what I thought. I was just making sure. Okay. So, um, we may need to do some table combination here so you can actually have discussion at your tables. Um, and so I don't know if you two want to move up here and if you want to come over here just so that we can still have discussion. Um, and I'm going to give you more time on this discussion question while we wait for, uh, we're still working on our Facebook feed here. Um, and so here, here comes the question. Uh, actually, it's on your sheets there. When you were a teenager, who was one of your favorite music artists? Uh, I didn't ask for your favorite because no one can ever pick a favorite. So hence one of your favorites. Um, now, for me, when I was a teenager, I kind of liked stuff that was a generation before me. So I liked the Steve Miller Band was one of my favorites. I enjoyed The Doors. That's actually a couple generations before me. But uh, if I were to say stuff that was contemporary to me when I was a teenager, I liked um, the Beastie Boys. Beastie Boys were good. I liked the Go-Go's. I like Huey Lewis and the News, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so at your table, share your name. And when you were a teenager, some of your favorite music artists and go. What's that? Well, I'm having you share at your tables because I don't want anyone to date themselves, obviously. So, yes. It's okay. It's all good. Go ahead. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay. It's all right. Hey, thanks, Ryan, for trying. Appreciate it. Okay, so Andy, is there any way to, to communicate, it can tell if anyone's even trying to get on Facebook? Okay, all right. So if you know anybody who's trying to get on via Facebook, just tell them it wasn't working tonight. <laughs> but YouTube is still on. Andy, YouTube is on. So if you're watching via YouTube, um, go ahead and text, or, and um, Andy, is there any way to communicate with the people on YouTube for you to do that, to get to tell them where to get the notes. Soon as you can do, if there's a way to tell them where to get the notes from, because they are posted. Uh, are they posted on our website? So if you're watching on YouTube and want to try to get the notes people have in the room, uh, they are on our website, tfrc.org. So, um, okay. What I want us to do to start is just watch. This is we're only going to watch like a minute of this, because I just wanted to give a summary of the chapters that we are. Uh, going to be looking at uh, tonight. Now, John has fully unpacked the message of the Lamb's unsealed scroll. And now he goes back to expand on three key themes that he's introduced earlier. The fall of Babylon, the final battle to defeat evil, and the arrival of the new Jerusalem. And each one of these explores the final coming of God's kingdom from a different angle. So first, the fall of Babylon. An angel shows John a stunning woman who's dressed like a queen, but she's drunk with the blood of the martyrs and of all innocent people. She's riding the dragon beast from the sign visions. It's a symbol of the rebellious nations. And she's called Babylon, the prostitute. Now, the detailed symbols of this vision, they would be very clear to John's first readers. He's personifying the military and economic power of the Roman Empire, but he's also doing more. In this vision, John has blended together words and images from every single Old Testament passage about the downfall of ancient Babylon, Tyre, and Edom. John showing how Rome is simply the newest version of the Old Testament archetype of humanity in rebellion against God. They come together and form nations that exalt their own economic and military security into a false God. This isn't something limited to the past, or the future. It's a portrait of the human condition throughout history. And Babylon's will come and go leading up to the day when Jesus returns to replace Babylon with his kingdom. But how will Jesus' kingdom come? Up to this point, the day of the Lord has been depicted as a day of fire or earthquake or harvest. And now it's depicted as... Okay, so we're going to be focusing tonight on the chapters that deal with the fall of Babylon. And so what I would like you to do at your tables... And I'm going to experiment with how much I'm going to have you go through at a time. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, but at your tables, let's just start with just the first six verses of Revelation 17. We're going to be in 17, 18, and the first half of 19 tonight. My goal is to be done next week. See what happens. Um, but just read the first six verses of Revelation 17. And then as a table, have someone at your table read that. And then as a table, just describe the woman. What's, you know, using the scripture. How does the scripture describe this woman? And then what do you think she might represent? Okay. And go.
Okay, let's just see what we've got here. Um, so let's start with just describing the woman. What kind of descriptions did you see in the passage? Dressed in purple and scarlet. And what else about her dress? Glittered with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And, and she had a golden cup in her hand. Okay? At the same time, she's a prostitute. And what are some other things that are said about her and, and other, you know, what else? Covered with blasphemous names. Drunk. Drunk with what? The blood of uh, the people of God. What else? What about the kings of the earth? Verse 2. The kings of the earth did what? And the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. So what kind of impression does this give you about her? Okay, evil, that's definitely there, but what else? Self-indulgence and what goes Again, think about think about the description of her in verse 4. Yeah, there's there's something seducing about it. Now, look. The um she has a golden cup. She has pearl. She has she looks the part. She looks the part of um, respect, beauty. There's something attractive about her. And yet at the same time, there's an evilness about her and the adulteries and the abominations. So there is this beauty and attraction and at the same time this evil and um, adulterous and abominations. So what might your guess be of what we're talking about here? What is John describing in this vision? Temptation, sin, but in what form? What form might this take? Maybe we need to go to the next section to uh, talk about that. But, um, yeah, let's, but, so just, let's just stay on this, these themes here. We've got this beauty and seduction, and yet at the same time, and there's this, there's almost a sense of royalty with her, and at the same time, there's evil and adulteries and blasphemies and abominations all at the same time. And my question is for us, well, what would that be? Okay, now for us it wouldn't be Rome, but in first century Christianity, it would be Rome. Now think about Rome. In all of its glory and in all of its splendor, and in every, I have never been to a state dinner. But my understanding of state dinners is you have the pomp and you have the circumstance and there's this regality and there's this, you know, you go to one of these things and you have this sense that I'm in this place and this is an important place. Or think about stadiums. I'm a sports nut. Um, go to Cowboy Stadium. I've been to Cowboy Stadium on a tour, not to a game. The place is amazing. Or you walk down the, the strip of Vegas. I absolutely love the water show at the Bellagio. I, <laughs> it is amazing. The Bellagio water show is, I love it. I absolutely love it. I can sit there for an hour just to wait every 15 minutes for a new show to come up. Um, it's just, you, you know, there is this sense of places. The places that have power or communicate power 
are very intoxicating. And it's very easy to get caught up in it. Now, if you mix that with evil, you got a pretty good one-two punch. All right. Now, let's, um, let's go ahead and move on to the beast. And that's verses 7 to 14. And do the same thing. Describe the beast. And what do you think he represents? Okay? And yes, question. You may, as long as I don't have to answer it. Yes. Okay, so the name written on her forehead was a mystery. Um, I, think, I think from a sense of mystery, um, I think it's, not, it's in the sense that it's not obvious. A mystery is something that's not obvious. So this woman, whatever she represents, is Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and the abominations of the earth. That would not be obvious. By the way she looks, and, and that would go back to, um, look, you know, when it comes to the power of the state, of nations and empires, it's not always obvious that it's evil. Because if it was obvious it was evil, most people would walk away. Part of, part of the lure of evil, well, it's what we would call in, in psychological language, gaslighting. Gaslighting is telling you that what you actually experienced is not real. So, like, if I were to come up to you and punch you in the face and you have a bloody nose, and then I were to say, well, I didn't give you that bloody nose. That's gaslighting, because I did give you the bloody nose. And if I'm good at gaslighting, I will get you to think, well, maybe, maybe you didn't give me the bloody nose. Maybe I experienced something else. Maybe I don't, you know, you know it's, it's just weird. Well, that's what evil does. You know, evil isn't obvious. Sometimes it is. Most of the time it's not. Okay? So that's, I think that's the mystery piece. But I think to answer your other question, in verse 6, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. I think that's a reference to martyrdom. And in, in many times when, and this isn't limited to Christians, um, I think any time you have any kind of genocide, the, the um, language is what we are doing by killing all these people is good. So in first century Rome, Christians were despised. They were kind of looked at as the scum of the earth. So for Nero to kill a bunch of them was actually a good thing in the eyes of Rome. So that's, that's the kind of stuff we're, you're dealing with there. And so the drunk on the blood of the, on the, blood of the people is that, again, drunkenness, not the hangover part, but drunkenness tends to be a fun time, a positive time. We're having a good time. While if I'm drunk on the blood of, of God's holy people, that means I had a good time killing them. I didn't kill them and then regret it. I thought what I was doing was good. And that happens all the time. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so did I answer you? Those okay? Okay. So verses 7 to 14, describe it, and then just speculate what it might represent or what you've experienced, whether through the first century eyes, I appreciate you doing that, Steve, or through 21st century eyes. So go ahead.
No, what was that? Okay, let's just uh, see what we've got here. What are some things that describe the beast? Seven heads and ten horns. Okay, Uh, what else? 
Correct. Once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss to go to its destruction. Good. Anything else? There's an eighth. Yeah, there's all these kings. We got seven kings, and then we have seven L's, and seven kings, and ten kings, and an eighth king, and a fifth king, and okay. That's great. And kings that don't have kingdoms, and, you know, some only rule for an hour, you know, okay. It's good. All right. So um, you, you do have... So let's just start by looking at this through the eyes of first century Christianity, which, you know, the one thing that just screams Rome are the seven hills. <coughs> the city of Rome in the first century was on seven hills. There is no way that you're going to read that and not think um, Rome. That would I'm trying to think of a comparison. Um, well, it would sort of be like saying, you know, four, uh, four rulers on a mountain. Well, if we were to say four rulers on a mountain or four presidents on a mountain, it's Rushmore. <laughs> we wouldn't think of anything else. It's Rushmore. Well, Seven Hills, that's Rome. Now, the problem with trying to come up with, okay, so if the seven kings are seven kings of Rome in the first century, you've got a problem. You've got all sorts of problems. Because... I actually had to look. I didn't write this down in my preparation, and I, I don't have it all memorized. But you, the first emperor, or the first Caesar, is Augustus. Um, and again, Augustus is one of the ten most influential people in the history of the world. Uh, when, I, I've said this before. When you were reading the Christmas story, in the days of Caesar Augustus, that would be like an American history saying, in the days of George Washington, it's a big deal. <laughs> so Augustus is a big deal. And then, um, so Augustus was first, Tiberius was second. Jesus' earthly ministry would have happened during the reign of Tiberius. He was born during Augustus, but his earthly ministry would have been during Tiberius. Uh, and then you have Caligula. Some of you have heard of Caligula. He's got a bad reputation. Then Claudius. He's not quite as well known. And then Nero. Notice Nero is number five. And there is, uh, what, there, this five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. So if we're going to call these the Roman emperors, well, then Nero would be the fifth. And that would make sense because Nero, when it came to persecution of Christians, um, was the trailblazer. But then after Nero, what happened is Nero dies in 68. And in 69, there's a power struggle of who's going to become the new emperor. And in 69 AD, you literally had four emperors in one year. Imagine having four presidents in one year, what that would do to us. They had four emperors in one year. But because all of those emperors were, again, because three of them didn't last, if you're going to count, you probably would only count the last one, who was Vespasian. And Vespasian, what's significant about him is in the late 60s, not 1960s, in the late original 60s, um, you had an uprising in Israel, the Zealots. And so Nero sent one of his generals, Vespasian, to go to Israel and take the Zealots out, which is exactly what Vespasian does. Just so you know, the first place Vespasian goes to take the Zealots out is not Jerusalem, the capital. He goes to the northern country of Galilee where Jesus did most of his earthly ministry because the major headquarters of the Zealots was on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. It was called Gamla. Remember that the next time that you read Jesus say something like, love your enemies. Jesus told people to love their enemies in Zealot country. 
How popular do you think that would have been in zealot country? That would be like telling Hamas, going to Hamas and saying, love your enemies. How popular do you think that would be? So, um, that's what Jesus did. We don't appreciate what Jesus, Jesus did. So anyway, so, but um, Nero dies, and you have these three other guys become emperor. Vespasian is in Israel, taking out the zealots. But his followers convince him to go back to Rome to take the throne, which is exactly what Vespasian does. And he leaves his son Titus to finish off the zealots, which is what happens. Titus, if you're familiar with the story of Masada, Titus is the one who takes care of Masada, and Titus is the one who destroys the temple and the city of Jerusalem. So Vespasian will die 10 years later in 79 uh, AD. Titus, his son, becomes emperor. Now again, imagine you're an early Christian. Look at the guys who are in charge. The guys who destroyed the temple and Jerusalem. Um, but then after Titus, you have Domitian. And Domitian is sort of a reincarnation of Nero. But in order for Domitian to become number, let's see, if Nero is five, Vespasian six, in order for Domitian to be seven, you'd have to skip Titus, which you could do because Titus reigned for less than two years. So, but do you see the issue is that you got to skip emperor. If you're going to go by numbers, there's a bunch of them you have to skip in order to get there. Probably a better understanding of the seven and the ten is what do seven and ten represent? Come on. Completeness. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So it's probably more about the completeness of these things rather than let's try to identify who all these people are. Now, you can do that. I'm just not. The other problem with that, though, is now you're limiting all of Revelation and Babylon to Rome. And I don't think that's John's intent. Rome, as the video said, um, is the current example of humanity being organized apart from God. The very first time humanity organizes apart from God is, anyone want to guess? It's in Scripture. There we go. The Tower of what? Babel. Oh, and what are we calling this lady who represents humanity organized against God, Babylon. What a coincidence. That's an amazing coincidence. No, Babylon is the world, humanity, organized apart from God, trying to seduce the world away from God. And Rome was simply the first century example of it. But it is by no means the only. There were plenty of examples before. And I bet if we look at world history, we could find some too. In fact, we don't have to go back very far. Like maybe World War II and Hitler. Does Hitler sound like a regime that had intoxicating power and was seductive? And yet was full of evil? Uh, yeah. And think of all the, now, did all those people think that what they were doing was evil at the time? No. It's called gaslighting. Oh, and what are people saying to this day about that? Oh, the Holocaust never happened. Well, that's gaslighting. That's what evil does. It's classic. Happens all the time. So, okay. Now, what about this whole thing about ruling for one hour? And we have these 10 kings who rule for one hour. I really think that's a great description of the fleeting nature of power. Uh, it came out either yesterday or today that the magazine Time named their person of the year. Anyone know who Time's person of the year is? Taylor Swift. I watch football not to watch Taylor Swift. But if you watch football, you can't escape Taylor Swift. It's amazing. 
Um, it's actually a brilliant publicity stunt by both her and the NFL, by the way. Um, but you know something? Can anyone tell me times person of the year last year? Five years ago? Ten years ago? Um, can anyone name me the President of the United States in 1923 without looking at your phones? Who, what was it? What is it? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't look it up because I just wanted to see if anyone would know. I thought maybe it was Coolidge. I thought it could have been Coolidge. Um, but again, or can anyone name the rich and powerful from 100 years ago? See, again, today we're all caught up in, you know, the, the, all your tech people, you know, the Facebook and, and um, Google and all of that. A hundred years from now, none of these people are going to matter. They are not going to matter. And yet, think of all the power and influence they have and how seductive it would be. Like, how cool would it be to be the friend of, you know, any of these guys and the power that comes along with it and how seductive that would be for us? Look, a hundred years ago, Anyone who sold their souls so that they could be a part of some rich and powerful person's empire made a bad decision. Because all that wealth and power doesn't matter anymore. But the condition of their souls does. And you see that message here. Yeah, you have all these kings that they get to rule for an hour. Um, and they will have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph. Folks, that has proven to be true for the last 2,000 years. And all we're experiencing today is the next round of it. But all the people today who are trying to seduce us to give up following the lamb for the power that they have to offer and the wealth they have offered, it's a bad trade. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yes. I know exactly which song you're talking to. Yes. For 2,000 years, the comment is in the in the music, in the uh, choir that's singing this Sunday, one of the songs has a line for 2,000 years. And you know something? I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but if it's not for another 2,000 years, we're going to keep singing. You know, one thing we don't appreciate about the Christmas story is it's not going away. There have been lots of attempts to get rid of it. It's not going anywhere. Okay, so uh, for, because I totally messed up time, I'm going to do Revelation 17, 15 to 18. Let's do this together, and I will read it. All of you follow along, and just be ready to answer the question, who destroys the woman? Verse 15, then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Oh, so this is another example that when you read in verse 2, verse, verse 1, that the prostitute sits by many waters. If you're wondering what those waters are, it tells you in verse 15. So this is another one of those softball interpretations. What are those many waters she sits by? Uh, they are the peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the, uh, and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Who destroys the woman? I thought they were on the same team. Disunity is a trait of the forces of evil. 
Rome is eventually destroyed. By who? God's people? No. One of the major causes of Rome falling was the internal strife of Rome itself. Another cause was an outside cause, the Vandals. Not the ones up in Idaho in the football playoff. The other Vandals. And just think of evil this way. Think of the mob. It is powerful. It is seductive. It does damage to good. But what happens to most people who are in leadership in the mob? How do they die? By the mob. Evil is not this one unified effort to destroy us, okay? There is disunity in it. And all of this is organized by God. God simply allows evil to destroy itself, at least in this case. In other cases, he takes a more active role. But just listen. If you want to turn to Romans chapter 1, you may. But I just want you to listen to this if you would like. Romans 1, verses 18 to 24. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. What does God do when people don't want to acknowledge him? He gives them over to what they want. And they will destroy themselves. We experience this all the time. People are often destroyed by themselves. And this is true on an individual level. And it's true on a national empire level. Make sense? Okay, now, uh, I should have saved us enough time. Go ahead and read all of Revelation 18. Don't go on to 19 yet. Go all of 18. And as you go, and after you read it, and if you want to do it section by section, that's fine. Um, but Revel- the first three verses ask the question, what happens to Babylon? Uh, Then 4 to 8, who is warned to get out and why? And then 9 to 19, why are the people sad over the fall of Babylon? 20 to 24, what will no longer happen in Babylon? So you can read all of 18 and then go section by section, or if you just want to go section by section and then answer. However you want to do it is great by me, but I'll give you some time to do that, okay? And go. Okay, Andy told me real quick, last year the Times Person of the Year was the President of Ukraine, and the year before that was Elon Musk. Oh, how things change, (laughs) because now Elon Musk is a pariah. So uh, that's amazing. Okay, keep going, sorry.
Okay, let's see how we do here. Um, what happens to Babylon? It's, it fall, it's fallen. There are evil spirits. Um, there will no longer be, let's see. Oh, uh, and you get the sense that the reason why this is the case is because the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. Um, and the kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. So Babylon has fallen. There are evil spirits in it. Uh, there, there's been adultery, there's wealth, there's excessive luxuries. And, and it seems like that the adultery and wealth and excess, excessive luxuries are the cause for the punishment. Um, and again, let's remember, or let's just assume for the next 11 minutes, that Babylon is not necessarily one particular kingdom, but is organized humanity apart from God. And so if organized humanity apart from God is Babylon, that is what will fall. And that is what will be filled with evil spirits. And that is where all of this adultery comes because we're chasing after the seduction of excessive wealth and luxury. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, uh, Revelation 18, 4 to 8. Who is warned to get out? God's people. Why? There's payback coming. Payback double for the damage she has done. And remember the phrase, in the world but not of the world. So it's okay for us to be in the world. We just don't want to become of the world. And the temptation to compromise with the world is great. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we probably have all done it to some extent. Um, and the, the warning here is get out of that. And I would add the qualifier, as much as reasonably possible, <laughs> okay, I'm gracious. <laughs> Get out of that as much as reasonably possible. Because the temptation to compromise with the world is great, and it's a bad trade. What good is it for you to gain the whole world and forfeit your own soul? That's a bad trade. But it's seductive. It's seductive. And this is why John has to warn the people, look, this is seductive, especially if you're under persecution. You're under pressure to give in. Um, and giving in will then not just relieve your pain, but give you comfort. That's, that's very seductive. Okay? All right. Uh, what about verses 9 to 19? Why are the people sad over the fall of Babylon? Like, why are the, um, let's see here, uh, why are the kings sad? They shared her, what does it say in verse 9? They committed adultery with her and shared her luxury. Okay, and why are the merchants, why are they going to weep? No one's buying their stuff anymore. So for them, what is it all about? It's the economics. And then um, what about the sea captains? They have no place to take their goods. It's all about what? The economy. Now, can we relate to this? <laughs> all right. Now, there are two ways you can maintain power. I don't care what the governmental system is. One, well, no, what the government system is does matter. But one is you can just be a tyrant and maintain power through power, having the military behind you, having the police force behind you. You know, think of Banana Republic kind of stuff. The country's in disarray, 
but the people in power are in power because they have the power, <laughs> okay? And they can, they can just keep people under their thumbs. The other way to get in power is have a good economy. Hitler didn't become a dictator by putting people under his thumb initially. Part of what got him into power was he turned around a horrible economy. Now, how he turned around the horrible economy, in part, was by stealing from all the Jews. When he, when, when he took out the Jews, he took their stuff. Well, when you can add millions and millions of dollars into your economy without having to buy, do anything with it, well, yeah, that works. <laughs> that works. But think about, you know, even in our uh, country where we have elections, it's the economy, stupid, <laughs> right? It's the economy. We are always arguing about the, you know, the people in power are either trying to convince us the economy is good or the economy is bad, depending on who they're trying to get elected. And I'm not making a statement about, you know, one party or another. I'm just saying that's how this game works. It's all about the economy. Because a good economy makes everybody happy. Well, that's just the problem. You realize in the Roman Empire, they had a great, again, Augustus had a great economy. And the first century of Rome had a great economy. Now, the underbelly of that is one-third of the Roman citizens, uh, not citizens, one-third of the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. One-third. Now, look, I'm not a very smart person, but if I could enslave 100 million Americans, could I deliver a good economy? I bet you I could. There's a dark underbelly to it. But the people, but those Roman emperors stayed in power in part because of the good economy, in part because one-third of Rome was slaves, and there were no social justice warriors saying slavery is bad. They didn't care. Why? The economy's good. And we experience stuff like that today. Okay? So it's all about economics. Um, now, just a quick qualifier. I am not judging. We are the wealthiest country in the world. I am not judging us because we like comfort and convenience. The fact that we are all sitting in this room, um, the heat is on even if it doesn't feel like it, uh, but we do have heat. The chairs are relatively comfortable. We have nice lighting. This is a nice spacious room. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But when comfort and convenience becomes the end-all, be-all. Well, now we got a problem. Like, if we were to say, I'm not coming to Bible study because the room isn't warm enough. Okay, well, we got a problem, <laughs> right? But the fact we're in a warm room, or it's not freezing. So I see many of you have coats on. Sorry about that. Uh, this is a bad example. <laughs> um, but, but again, so I'm not saying comfort and convenience and wealth are bad. That is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying when that becomes the end-all, be-all, we've got our priorities mixed up. There are plenty of wealthy people who have their priorities straight. Okay? I want to make sure that's clear. All right. Um, all right. Uh, Revelation 18, 20, 24. What will no longer happen in Babylon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it names specific things. What specific things does it name? Music, trade workers, weddings, light, merchants. Uh, yeah, and the blood of the saints. That ain't going to happen anymore either. And so there's a sense of, hey, look, if you are longing for justice to be done, we are going to be persecuted now vindicated later. That's what John is telling 
the church through this vision that God gives him. That look, stay the course. Stay the course. Because everything you see about the glory of Rome is temporary. It is not worth exchanging your souls for. And as I've said many times, and even just in this class, the vision of Revelation was right. Because <laughs> 2,000 years later, Rome, the Roman Empire at least, is gone. It's gone. And the um, gospel moves forward. And every other kingdom that comes to challenge will one day be gone. We have 2,000 years of evidence for it. And there are currently 2 billion people who claim allegiance to Jesus. The Roman Empire never had 2 billion people in it, ever. So what John says through his vision from God was right. He was right. We, all, we, we can all see it. Roman Empire is gone. And as I once heard one person say, no, I won't repeat that. I've met people named Caesar. <laughs> I once heard a pastor say, we name our kids Peter, Paul, Mary, and we name our dogs Caesar. But I have met people named Caesar. So I'm not, if your name is Caesar, I have high respect for you. Okay. Um, all right, and then the last part, I'm just going to read and then give a brief explanation because I'm at time. Um, after I, this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belongs to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of the servant, his servants. And again, they shouted, Hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen, hallelujah. And then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what looked like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like the loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Again, that's another, I'm telling you what this means, line. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Meaning, this is going to happen. And again, heaven is rejoicing at the fall of evil. And here is a nice little bit of trivia for you. Four times we see the word hallelujah. Now, we are very familiar, if we've grown up in the church, with that word hallelujah. These are the only four times in the Bible you will see the word hallelujah. So you can double check that if you want, but I looked it up earlier. Um, and it's the only places that I could find, hallelujah, and I did, that's not original to me. I read that somewhere, okay? Um, and I trust the source. So, again, the wedding of the Lamb, that's the place you want to be. <laughs> what does it say? Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Those who are persecuted for the faith, John is basically saying, are the ones who are blessed. Because the people living in wealth and glory and all that seductive stuff, which, again, I'll be the first one to admit, I find it very appealing. Okay. Um, it's all temporary. And it's all going to go away. The only thing that's going to last is what we're reading about next. Okay? All right. Uh, if you have questions for me, I'll sit up here. You can come up when class is over. I will pray. We will meet again next week. Um, and my goal is to be done. So let me pray. 
Lord, again, thank you for your goodness to us. And I ask once again, uh, Lord, I, I will freely admit that um, uh, the lure of Babylon is seductive. And um, Lord, help me see ways in which I have succumbed to it. But Lord, I thank you for the hope that you give me and that my ultimate um, <laughs> anchor is uh, your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Have a great night, everybody.